We are followers of Christ. We face an enemy who wants to label, divide, and destroy. We must take our stand in this world and put on the full armor of God. We must be unified. We are one in Christ. In Him, all physical and worldly labels disappear. His love for us has nothing to do with merit, ethnicity, or upbringing. It has everything to do with God choosing to make us alive in Christ, to redeem us through the blood of His Son. This is our fight. This is our calling. We will walk worthy. Before, before I get started, um, uh, every, every day, every week, we are bombarded by experts who tell us what worship in church ought to be like. And according to all the uh, experts, we're doing it wrong. Uh, but uh, I, I'm not going to give up just what we saw. Uh, I'm not going to give up the leadership of our senior adults, our children, our students, uh, and our worship choir just to throw one pitch. We're not going to do that. And I'm, I'm grateful to serve with somebody like Dennis Worley and the leadership team of our worship ministry who has the capacity to throw all of those pitches. Uh, I know you come here and you say, they don't ever sing my favorite song. They don't ever sing my favorite song either. And so just deal with it. <laughs> and come back next Sunday, we'll probably get close to it like what you saw today. So I'm very, very grateful. Uh, to be on a staff that has that kind of reach and a church that has that kind of depth and breadth. So what you saw up there, you do not see much uh, around other churches, and it's uh, one of the things that makes this congregation uh, very unique. Uh, a lot of you travel uh, during the week for your jobs, and, and you do your best to stay in touch with your kids while you're out. You, you FaceTime, you Skype. Uh, you text, you email, uh, but the day that you come back home, when you, uh, the, the plane lands or you drive back in the driveway and you walk back down into the hallway of your home and your kids see you and daddy, 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 mommy, 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 I'm so glad to see you. I'm glad you're home. What's the next question? What did you bring me? What did you bring me? Did you bring me a hat from where you were? Did you bring me something special from what you saw? Did you bring me some kind of present? Because every time you go away, you bring me something. Daddy, 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 mommy, 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 did you bring me something? Kind of funny, isn't it? Kids never change, no matter how tall we get. And so we have gathered in this place of worship to meet our Lord and Savior. And our first question is, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Did you bring us anything? And how? That's what Paul is talking about in the fourth chapter of Ephesians. Stand with me now in the honor of God's Word. So we read this familiar passage together. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling that you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, accepting one another in love, diligently keeping the unity of the Spirit with the peace that binds us. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in all. Now grace was given to each of us according to the measure of the Messiah's gift. For it says, he ascended on high, and he took prisoners into captivity. He gave gifts to people. But what does he ascended mean except that he descended to the lower parts of the earth? The ones who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. He personally gave some the gift to be an apostle, some prophet, some evangelist, some pastors and teachers for the training of the saints and the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man with stature measured by Christ's fullness. 
Then we would no longer be little children tossed by waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into Him who is the head, Christ. From Him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love and the proper working of each individual part. Therefore, as a prisoner in, of, of the Lord, I urge you, walk worthy of the calling that you have received. This is God's Word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. To a tough little group of believers, Paul wrote this letter, and through the generations it has now come to us, followers of you who find ourselves much in this situation that the Ephesians found themselves in. And now we read that you have gifted each of us as the body has need to do the work to which you have called us. May each of us now find our place to do your work. And we pray this in your name. Amen. I am afraid that sometimes our familiarity with the Bible, we grow used to reading it. And so we grow comfortable with the great truths. Uh, we'll say things like, Jesus has saved my life or saved my soul or I'm born again. And it won't mean anything. It won't change anything. We won't pause in, in, in any way to remember what that encounter meant and, and what's transformed since that encounter. Uh, for instance, we don't spend a whole lot of time remembering what it was to be lost. Uh, you know, I, I tell you all the time about, we forget that to be lost means you don't know how you got there, you don't know where you are, you don't know how to get back. And you call your friend that you were going to meet and you say, hey, I'm lost. And their first question is, where are you? Well, if I knew that, I wouldn't be lost. But that is something we forget, isn't it? That feeling of looking in the mirror and not knowing who you are. Or for the life of you, not knowing why you made such a stupid decision. Of looking around at the people you have hurt by the things you have done and knowing that what you have broken you cannot fix. What's lost can't be found again. And to know that for once in your life it is your fault it's not your parents' fault. It's not society's fault. It's your fault. And all the king's men and all the king's horses can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. You remember what that was like? Do you remember when somebody told you about what Jesus had done on the cross? about what it meant to be forgiven of your sins, and your first response was, hey, it can't be that easy. No, it's not easy. Don't hear me say it was easy. It's impossible. No way, no how can you and I figure out our own salvation or work out our own grace. We can't do that. It is a free gift given to you by Jesus Christ, paid in full by His sacrifice, given to you in the transformation of His resurrection. Now, I've just thrown around a whole lot of terms, but you need to, re you need, and you and I need to spend a moment every now and then just remember what, it, what happened when we were brought to new life in Jesus Christ. That's what, that's what Paul is talking about. The, the first three chapters of Ephesians are theology. Verse 1 of chapter 4 is the transition verse, the hinge verse that tells us now I'm going from the theology to the application of that theology. And here's the things that I want you to know out of the things I have told you. Paul says, I want you to remember to live a life worthy of the calling that you have. You can't be worthy of the calling that you've been given, but you can live in a worthy manner now that you are called. And he talks about how each of us have a place in the body, this body that we're all part of together. Uh, Paul is stressing unity to the Ephesian church. Why? Because if you and I saw the Ephesian church, we would be shocked by the diversity. 
Uh, you would have all kind of people in there. You would have slaves. Uh, you would have the very wealthy. Uh, there would be a vast gap of the socioeconomic uh, levels of the congregation. You would have Jews and Gentiles. You would have people from all over the world, all over the Roman Empire. Every status of the Roman Empire would be in this church. Because uh, Ephesus was a port city. It was a very Roman city. A lot of people had come from the empire to live there, make their living there. And all of those people were ending up in the church. And, and when you went to that church, you would look around and you would say, how did that person get in here? Okay? Every kid does this, right? One day you're sitting and talking with your mom and dad. You point to your brother and sister and say, where did they come from? Right? We all want to know, why did you bring him her home? Why do we have to have her? Okay? Every, every, every kid does this. And the answer is, they got here the same way you did. Okay? I know sometimes you look around the, the, the church, you'll see somebody in the hall, and your question is, well, I, mm, I know that person's story. How did they get here? Same way you did. Same way I did. Grace through the doors open. I let everybody who will come in. Now, when you start picking up standards of, well, we, we can only love people like this, or we can only forgive people who did this, but not who did that, then sooner or later, you're going to be on a list that doesn't get in. Okay? I, I, I tell you all the time, nothing messes the church up any more than when God starts saving the wrong people. <laughs> right? Let the wrong people get saved, and oh, now things are out of hand. You got here the same way they did. I got here the same way you did. You got here the same way I did. Grace let us all in. And there, and there is something about knowing that everyone in here is a loser loved by Jesus. Now, it doesn't matter if you're the 15th worst loser or the 300th worst loser. You're a loser. You don't deserve to be here. Jesus' grace lets you in. We're all losers loved by Jesus. That's the foundation of the unity. We're all saved by grace. All sinners saved by grace. The details may be different, but the story is the same. Now, here is what Paul wants you to understand, wants us to understand. You are saved from your sins and saved for a calling. You are saved from, saved for. I know a lot of us get excited because we're saved from. That's just half the story. That's like going home at intermission. There's more for Jesus to do in your life. Biblical truth number one in this passage is this. Every child of Jesus Christ has a calling. You are called to be somewhere, do something that is significant to this body. Okay? Biblical truth number one, everybody has a calling. Biblical truth number two, every child is given a, gifts appropriate to that calling. Okay? If you have a calling, you're going to have gifts that back up that calling. Okay? Some of you walk into my office, my study, and you see all the books. And you say, have you read all of those books? Yes. Most of them. Why? I love this stuff. Okay? I love, I, I, I'm reading a book now by, by my friend Craig Keener, who is a New Testament theologian out of Asbury uh, Theological Seminary in, in Kentucky. And it's about how Paul understands and teaches the, the, the transformation of the mind, what it means to be saved in your mind, be, be transformed in your mind, be renewed in your thinking, all of those passages. Okay? I, I'm reading it, and I'm reading it yesterday morning. I'm loving this stuff. And Jeannie says, what are you reading? I show her the book. She says, you're weird. <laughs> now, how would you feel if I stood up here and said, you know, I hate reading Scripture. I can't make any sense out of it. <laughs> I, all those these and thous, I just don't, I don't get any of that. You would not have a whole lot of hope or expectation for the sermon to follow. But I am gifted appropriately to the calling that I have. Okay? You are the same way. You are gifted for the calling that you have. 
we have people in this church who believe we should not have a student ministry, Garrett, that it should all be in preschool. If you don't reach a child before they're five, you can't do it. You got to get them before they're five, preacher. And these are the people who are gifted and called to work with preschoolers. Put them in students and they fail. Okay? They don't have the gifts for that. They're not called to that. Okay? Now, Garrett thinks we need to stop everything else, put everything in student work. Right? Dennis thinks all we need to do is worship. I think all we need to do is study the Bible. We're all right. We're all wrong. We're all gifted according to our calling. Okay? Now, you're gifted according to your calling. Now, you don't understand that gift. Let me tell you why. Because gifts are easy. Okay? If you're gifted in something, it comes easily to you, and you don't think anything about it. Because we have this misunderstanding that if it's of Jesus, it's got to be hard. If I'm serving Jesus, I've got to sweat. I gotta, I gotta, it's got to be effort. It's a gift. Okay? It's given to you. And, and, and nothing infuriates me more <laughs> than to talk to one of our musicians after they have done something amazing, and I walk up to them and say, gosh, I was, that was incredible. And they'll say, anybody can do that. <laughs> I know one person that can't. <laughs> okay? Because it comes easily to you, you do not value it. Okay? Uh, anybody can do this. Sometimes you'll come up to me and say, how did you see that in that passage of Scripture? How much do you see it? It was right there. You didn't. What's wrong with y'all? See? Okay. It's, it's the way I'm wired. It's, I'm, it's, it's the way I'm gifted. You're wired. You're gifted a different way. That's why you need the church around you to tell you what your gift is. Somebody has to say, you're good at this. And you'll say, this, this is not, this is not anything. Anybody can do this. No. This is why you're on this team. This is why you're part of this church, because this is what you bring to us. We're all called, we're all given gifts according to our calling, which leads us now to biblical truth number three. Biblical truth number three is, I forgot the number order I put them in. Here it is, every believer is gifted. All of you have a gift. To say that you don't have a gift is a denial of a clear biblical teaching. Some of you have more than one gift, but everybody has one. Everybody has one, and we are to use these gifts for the strengthening, encouragement, building up of the body, which leads us to biblical truth number four. I know what all seven of them are. I just can't remember what number I put them up in there. We all have different gifts. Now, here, why, here let me tell you why this is important. If you have a gift and recognize it, then you think everybody should have your gift, right? You think it's the only gift that matters, okay? If, if this is the way that you, that, that you found Christ and everybody's experience with Jesus is judged by your experience with Jesus, Jesus is going to treat you differently because you are different than any other of his children, okay? You're going to have a different experience. You're going to have a different gifting. No one has all the gifts. We all have different gifts. And no one gift is better than the other gift. Okay? Uh, I, 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 like, I, I love to preach, you know that. And of course I think preaching is the most important thing this church needs to do. We have tech people that I love and encourage because I know if I'm preaching in the dark with no sound support, it's going to be a lousy sermon. And now they have different gifts than I do. They have different passions than I do. Both of the gifts are significant. Do not ever think that your gift doesn't matter because it's the whole body that has to hang in. We need a right hand, we need a left hand. We need two ears, two eyes, two feet. The whole body's not a foot, the whole body's not a hand. Okay, it takes all the different gifts to make the body work, which leads us to the next spiritual gift, which is, it's not for you. You're to work together for the greater good of the body. It is the working together of the body. Leads us to the next spiritual truth, which is the body is crippled to the extent that you do not participate. Okay? 
Um, some of you say, my gift doesn't matter. It's too small. Uh, that's like the pinky saying, I'm not needed. Okay? And I want to tell you something. If your pinky hurts, your whole body stops and focuses nothing on the pinky. If you've ever tried to get in the bed in the night and stump your toe, you know your whole body will stop and see if the toe is okay. Every part of your body, your eyes will fixate on the toe. Your hands will reach for the toe. Your, 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 your mouth will give words to the toe that the words can, the toe cannot say. <laughs> but if this toe could speak, this is what it would say. It's all the body together, seven, because we do it all for the glory of God. There is something about all of us working together that lets the glory and the, and the beauty of God be known in a way that the one person cannot. It was all of our orchestra today. It was all of our choir today that made you see something about God differently in a way that one person alone can't do it. It's when the world sees the church working together and says to itself, that won't work. There's too great a difference, too much ethnic difference, too much socioeconomic difference, too much history difference, too much wrong side of the tracks difference, too much difference for that ever to work, to see it work that makes people curious about the presence of God. Now, um, people who stay up late at night and study these things have found a new group of people. Now, you've heard about the nuns, N-O-N-E, nun. Uh, the nuns are the group of people who claim no religious faith whatsoever. And when they do a, a survey, uh, a, a census, and you put down your religious affiliation, these people check none. It's the fastest growing group in North America. Okay, and so we're all a, a tizzy about how we reach the nuns. We have discovered a different group of people. They're called the duns, D-O-N-E, done. These are people who would still claim to be Christian but have no engagement with the local church. They say, we've had it with church, we're tired of the hypocrites, we're tired of this, we're tired of that, and they don't go to church anymore, but they still claim to be Christian. Uh, I, I know it's real hip right now to tell Jesus that I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. Okay? Now, I, I won't be real honest with you. Jesus called the church his bride. Now, I have some friends, brothers, blood, I mean, closer than brothers, that, that I would die for, and they would die for me. If they call, I'm there, they're there for me, we're that close. As close as I am to these guys, I don't know one of them that I can walk up to and say, brother, I love you, I'm there for you, you know that. Nothing will ever make us separate. I'm always there for you, but I can't stand your wife. <laughs> now, how long does that friendship last? And yet, we have people all over America who want to say to Jesus, I love you, Jesus, but I can't stand your wife. People who tell me they love Jesus but don't love the church, I tell them, then you haven't talked to Jesus lately. Because if you talk to Jesus very long, he'll tell you how much he loves the church. Amen. Here's my theory on the Duns. I think people leave the church because they're bored. Because we don't ask you to do anything great. We don't challenge you to carry out the Great Commission in ways that you are uniquely gifted to do. You go home thinking they don't need me or somebody else can do that. And that's our fault. But here's what we're finding out in this Middle Tennessee initiative. We need all of you. We need every gift set. We need every person. Uh, we've got opportunities to teach English as a second language to first generation immigrants. 
and use that as an opportunity. We have opportunities for tax accountants to, figure, to help people figure out their, their annual uh, uh, taxes that they send in and use that as an evangelism thing. We need small group leaders. We need lots more small group leaders so we can send small groups out into areas and, for, and use those small groups as a stepping stone to start a church, plan a church, re, move a regional campus, on and on the list goes. We need musicians because we've got six campuses and we're going to be adding more campuses. So we're going to be needing more and more worship leaders because Middle Tennessee is lost without Jesus Christ. And you and I are the ones called to tell them that good news. We need every one of you. Which leads me to the last question. Why not? Why not? I'm going to be real blunt with you. If you're not connected in some church serving, kingdom building, God glorifying ministry, you are living in direct, con, uh, direct disobedience to the clear teaching of Scripture. Why not? I know. You tried once and you failed. Join the club. From everybody here, all the way back to Paul and Peter, Moses, David, everybody else in the Bible. You got your feelings hurt. I know. Don't let that keep you home. You messed up. You're afraid somebody's going to find out about your past. Somebody's going to put it on Facebook. And you'll be running for president having to explain yourself. <laughs> Jesus forgave it. Jesus isn't bringing it up anymore. He doesn't want you to either. Amen. As far as the east is from the west, that's his promise. Don't let the past rob you of the future that Christ wants to give you to. So why not? I beg you, as a prisoner of the Lord Jesus, Live a life worthy of this calling. Let's pray together. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I, I, I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you or put you on the spot. But I do want you thinking about your life in this moment. Some of you have gifts, you have talents, and you know it, and you're not connected. You're not making any difference. So you walk out, and you find that table that says next steps. Let us help you get that, that connection made, that process started. Some of you, you really don't know. Nobody's ever talked to you about giftedness and calling and all of that. Find that same table. Talk to them about finding a thing called place. We'll help you get that information will help you find out more about who you are and how you're wired. It will make a tremendous difference in your life. Maybe it's time to be part of this church fellowship. You come on. We'll get that process started. We need you to do the work that God's calling us to do. Or maybe you're here. And the thing you know is that you don't know Jesus. The only thing you know is what you have said you can unsay. What you have broken you cannot fix. What you have lost you cannot find. Christ is here now, brought you to this place to tell you about forgiveness, to tell you about redemption, to tell you about salvation, to tell you about a future and a life he has for you. And I, I know I've said a whole lot and a handful of words. Our friends are waiting for you out at this table that says next step. Just go and say, hey, I'd like to know more about what Mike was talking about. They'll pick it up from there. I beg you, do not leave this place not knowing who you are, not knowing whose you are.
Lord Jesus, every life is open, every heart. We pray the choices we make now are exactly what you want.